Hey everybody, welcome back to Learners Cast. I'm Matt. And I'm your, I'm not your only host, but I am a host, Tyler. I'm, we're not starting over again. We're leaving that. As we should. We joked the first time we did that that he remembered his name. This time, he forgot his name. Like it, It's okay. I forgot that we're doing it that way, and he forgot his name. That's how this episode is going to go. We have absolutely uh, no hope for us to actually have a co coherent episode i'm just i mean so the question don't, I mean, don't be surprised when it's 45 minutes in and we're just getting to the main topic we warned you more likely 45 minutes in we still haven't done the contact information yet because we're still <laughs> bullshitting about suckless software okay uh so tyler what have you done this mm -hmm. week in linux Oh, as busy as it's been, not too much. However, I have decided that I'm going to spend a full week just using Suckless software again. I've done this in the past, but I'm hoping that Surf, the one weak link of all Suckless software, which, by the way, if that upsets you, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Surf is terrible. The, the truth must just hurt. Uh, <laughs> Surf is the weak, weak link of all Suckless software. And hopefully there's been some minor improvements that make it at least usable. Mm -hmm. um, nope. Yeah, <laughs> I don't figure so. Yeah. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that and see how it is uh, on uh, my uh, hallway laptop that I'm using because it's low power as hell. I can charge it with a USB-C cord, which is nice. But um, yeah, that, that's what I'm up to. All what right. you up to? Surf, uh, before we move on to me. Surf is just so slow. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. so slow. I, I mean, it, it's like noticeably slow. Like, it's not like every once like Firefox compared to like Chromium and sometimes is sometimes slower, but you can notice that Surf is slow. Like, it's sometimes just like. It, sometimes it genuinely surprises you how slow it is. Yeah, it's it's really. <laughs> it's like I, and the thing is, a. Uh, they shouldn't make a browser. Okay, I'm just going to put this right out there. They shouldn't make one because they don't update their software often enough to mm -hmm. be good at doing a browser. Browsers need constant iteration and mm -hmm. updates and stuff like that. And, and here's the thing. Their core philosophy does not align with the internet in general. No. Like, no. Now, if they made like a Gemini browser, that would make sense. That that would make total sense. Uh, but there were like even just making a web browser in the first like you can't be suckless and make a browser for the web that people are going to actually use. Your core values don't even align with the internet. Uh, what are you doing? Because your suckless philosophy comes straight up against the wall that is JavaScript. You know, what exactly. I mean? like, like I, I mean, seriously, it just doesn't. I. I the the thing is is cute browser does it well because it actually mm. you know works and it's fast and runs on modern technologies and it's constantly updated like like every time i do an arch update there's an update for cute browser it feels like you know mm. and, and that's just like one guy like mm -hmm. cute browser is like one dude <laughs> like i'm sure yeah, well, i'm sure the... there's i'm sure there's a community that's supporting it but like it's ran, ran by like one dude so i mean yeah. like i don't well, see, like the the thing that I under the reason I can understand and appreciate Chromium more is only because, or uh, not Chromium, um, uh, good Lord, Q Browser is because it is the Chromium web engine stripped down, and then all of that plugin UI, all of that well UI in general, it's just cleaned and scraped out of there, and you get this nice keyboard driven environment, and it's got to be easier to maintain than something like a Suckless, where you're, yeah, I mean, you're using a web engine, but you're also, like, I genuinely don't know what makes Suckless so slow. I don't understand. I will never understand it. Well, because they have no interest in doing anything to speed it up, if, if they went through and did any tweaking of it to speed it up, then it wouldn't be Suckless anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's the reason why. I mean, it, it, like I said before, they should just not make a browser. It just it just shouldn't exist. I mean, I understand mm -hmm. why they want to have that kind of whole suite of software that goes by their philosophy, but that's the one thing you just really can't do in a suckless way. Um, yeah. like, you can't. Plus, I mean, it, it, it's just, I don't know, like I said, it's just not updated often enough to keep up with the way the, the internet changes. 
you know? All right. Mm -hmm. So I have two things to talk about this week. Uh, and I'm going to make a video about the the first one. I've been using GNOME now for uh, five, six days, five days, I think. Mm -hmm. And you have loved every second of it. <laughs> it's been the best time of your life. Yes. Uh-huh. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it hasn't. It has not been as bad as I thought it was going to be. So I will say that. Okay. Um, it is usable. I, now, I have used it the whole time without any extensions. Zero. The only thing I've done is download Tweak Tools so I could change the theme. Because I was not using Adawaita. I was just not going to do that. I would I would literally die before I ever used that theme. Uh, so, I have downloaded twe download tweaks and changed the themes. And it's fine. That's all I've done. And, I've, and then I've gone through and just made it keyboard driven. I mean, that's the way they want you to use GNOME is through your keyboard. So I've done that. I'm used to using the keyboard to do a window manager, so it makes sense to me. Uh, some of the default key bindings are just the dumbest, most dumb thing ever. But mm -hmm. once I've changed them, it's fine. Uh, I have had some instances where it freezes for whatever reason. Like yesterday, I hit the, the super key in order to get the the multitasking view and it froze there i had to actually literally restart my computer it was like i was on windows vista again and i had to hit control alt delete you know i literally had to go <laughs> into a tty and reboot my computer in order for it to come back and uh, i don't understand i don't know whether that's a an, an arch problem or if that's a gnome problem that was a pain in the ass um i also still have not managed to get it so that the the, the screen will go to sleep after a certain amount of inactivity. I've not been able to do it. Uh, I've looked on the internet every single day since I've started. There's uh, Somebody told me to download GNOME Screensaver, which is abandoned, but apparently used to work. That didn't work. I, I uh, The replacement for that was X Screensaver. I downloaded that and made sure that was running. That didn't work. Uh, somebody told me that I just had to lock the screen, so there's a key binding to lock the screen. And uh, so I locked the screen, and all that managed to do was bring up the lock screen for the whole time I was away from my computer. The screen's never turned off. Um, and so, so I mean, I've tried five or six different things. There was somebody, there was a, there was, I bumped my microphone again, but there, uh, somebody told me there was a, a solution f to change it, like a config file for GTK or something uh, in order to get it done. I tried that. That didn't work. So, uh, this whole experience of me trying to get the screens just to turn off because you know I, I when i get up and go use the standing desk that i get made fun of you know i actually have to get up and go over there and use the standing desk uh you know i want these monitors to turn off after like 10 minutes or something like whatever i have whatever it doesn't matter but it won't work so the screens stay on and i i don't like that i like conserving at least a little bit of electricity you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, yeah just a tiny bit you know, I do my part, but it's just so I, I don't I I have had that problem before in the past when I use GTK based or GNOME based uh like desktop environments. Like when I used Budgie for a while, that had the same problem on Arch because there's some dependency there that's just I'm missing. Like it's some dependency that handles that functionality. The problem is, is there's no documentation for that functionality at all, so I have no clue what <laughs> dependency I'm missing, and why it's not bundled with with GNOME on Arch in the first place. Whatever that dependency is, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me, uh, and it pisses me off uh, uh, a lot. Uh, so that has been a problem with GNOME. Uh, I also have just found it boring, like. I, I can understand now more why people use it because there's nothing to do in it other than do your work. You get in there and you do your work. You don't go through and you know, you know, mess around with Windows and stuff like that. It's um, it's just you do your work and it's it's fine. You know, it's not interesting to me whatsoever. You know, I ha I have no interest in changing the color scheme again. Like it's fine. You know, yeah, I, I, <laughs> it's good though. I mean, GNOME don't really change that much. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's fine. I don't know. It's not it, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Um, it's weird being in a floating window manager again. Like I can go through and take the window and swirl it around and around and around and around like a like a fidget spinner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what I'm hearing is is you now love GNOME? Yes. I can't wait. 
to go back to a tiling window manager. Uh, I'm gonna sounds like love to me. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna spend the next uh, two days in it. So I got Friday and Saturday left. I'm gonna make my video on Saturday. Um, and today I, I'm gonna go through and install some extensions. Uh, I'm gonna the last two or three days I'm gonna use with some extensions, even though it's outside of the purview of what the GNOME developers want. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna install the tiling. Uh, extension so I can have like a tiling window manager effect. I'm going to change it so that the dock is available all the time and stuff like that. I'm going to just do as much tweaking as I want for the next thing and see if that makes GNOME you know, more interesting to me. Because right now it's just it's boring, you know? Like mm -hmm. even with like XFCE or Cinnamon or, you know, uh, obviously Plasma, you know, there's tons of stuff you can do to tweak it and play around with it. And I, I guess it goes towards my mentality of always wanting to tweak and uh, you know, mess around with my desktop environment. Uh, you know, maybe there is something to the GNOME madness of not doing that because really all you can do in GNOME is your work. You can't go through and do anything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that is what it's made for. It It is made so that you get your work done. And then like our arguments about it being uncustomizable is sort of like a, I feel like that's what the devs use right back at us. They're like, yeah, it's not meant for that. It's not meant for customizing. It's not meant for all that stuff. It's just meant for you to hop in and you get your work done. And it generally makes sense. Um, and also has big flashy buttons. So, yay. <laughs> so, once we get to the news item, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, so, all right. So, the second thing <laughs> uh, I want to talk about in this section is that I'm having some Linux problems. So I, I, I've talked about this before, but uh, my keyboard just periodically doesn't stops working. And I have to unplug the keyboard and plug it back in in order to get to work. Now, uh, I thought that it was the keyboard itself. So I took this $180 keyboard away and got the, the um, God, I don't know what the hell that keyboard is. I don't remember. Uh, but anyways, the keyboard that normally sits on that desk and swapped them around. Uh, and because I thought it was the keyboard, so I used that for a few days, and it, the same thing happens. So it's not the keyboard, it's not the cord, because it was a completely different cord. So um, the, the only other two options are: is it's the operating system, which is Arco, or it's the computer itself. So in in hope that it's not a hardware problem, because if it is, I'm screwed. Um, cause you can't buy shit anymore <laughs> mm -hmm. like, yep. unless you have like a million dollars. Um, uh, so I, I, I've started to think about hopping away from Arco, despite the fact that everything else on the system works fantastically. I think I don't want to hop so bad. And I've been dragging my feet cause I talked about it two days ago. I was going to do it two days ago, but I just so don't want to do it because it's, everything else works so good. Um, so, yeah, I'm in the process of thinking about distro hopping again. I'm not sure where I would go. Uh, I know where, like, Joshua Lee and F Society and all those guys would want me to go. I guess it's not going to be Gen 2. I'm just sorry. It's not going to be Gen 2. Um, so it's going to be I, – I just don't know what distro I'm going to end up landing on yet. Um, well, don't worry. It's a long road to heaven, man. And when you end up in Gen 2, I mean heaven, um, <laughs> <laughs> love to talk, man. Um, see, the thing is, I, I'm tempt. I don't, so, somebody asked me, I think it was Joshua on Patreon, uh, asked me what the big deal about the AUR is and why Arch users hate leaving the AUR behind. And the thing is, is I've never gone into an Arch-based system and not been able to go through and download a piece of software that I wanted. It, as long as the AUR is enabled, I can find any piece of software. I've never found a single piece of software ever that wasn't in the AUR. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Uh, if you come across something random on the internet and you want it, don't spend your time compiling it from source because that's a waste of time. It's definitely in the AUR. Right. Just pull it down from the AUR. Well, like the other day, I was working on a video about the top five, like, or or five alternatives to NeoFetch. And I found some, like, random shit. Like, the, like just a random person made a fetch application, posted it on Reddit. That was in the AUR, okay? It was. So, mm -hmm. um, 
the reason why I don't want to leave the AUR behind is because of that experience. You don't have that experience anywhere else. The only place that I've come close to finding that is on OpenSUSE. OpenSUSE has a huge repository. I don't know if, I mean, and it's not close to the AUR, but it's, it's, it's good. Uh, the problem with OpenSUSE is that Zipper is the slowest package manager you've ever seen in your life. It is so <laughs> slow. It's like the, it's just so it's it's like surf level slow, you know. It's just mm-hmm. it's really slow. Um, I've really enjoyed my time with OpenSUSE. I, I've considered making that my actual daily driver. Just uh, so oh, really, I, I've considered it, but that zipper is just so slow. Yast Yast is awesome. Yast is mm-hmm. so good. Um, but again, it's slow. Like it, it's in an, you can tell it was designed in another era because it's very clunky too. But um, yeah, so I don't know where I'm going to end up. It's probably going to be on like Garuda or Endeavor OS just because I want to try to see if a different OS, but still Arch based, has the same problems with the keyboard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then I'll probably go to like something like MX or maybe the like Gecko Linux or Sparky or something, something different. Wait, have you tried just changing up the kernel? I'm, I'm not on an LTS kernel, I'm on the, the latest kernel. Uh, and well, it just, it just uh, have you? You might want to just try, just for the sake of argument, just try the Zen kernel, since it's aimed more at desktops. It might have better support for your, um, you I know, could, different desktop devices. I could give it a try. The thing is that it, this problem has been happening over multiple kernels, so it's like it's been going on mm-hmm. for a while. So it's been going on throughout five dot like thirteen and all five dot fourteen. Uh, so. I don't know. Like I said, I could give it a try. It's not going to hurt anything, especially if I'm going to hop anyways. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. That, that's going to be that's going to be a project for this weekend. Um I'll see I'll I'll update everybody next week on where I end up. It'll probably knowing me be right back on Arco. <laughs> that's probably I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> like like we've done it. We've we've played this game before. All right. The, I don't know what it is about this podcast. But every time we start, my nose starts itching. Uh-huh. It's the dumbest thing. All right. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> on that note, let's go ahead and move to the contact information. We're only 22 minutes in, so we're only halfway towards <laughs> the, the 40 minutes that we predicted. <laughs> uh, you can get in contact with us if you, you'd like to do so at Twitter. You can do it at Twitter, on Twitter, at the LinuxCast on Twitter. Uh, you can subscribe to all of our audio feeds and all that stuff at the LinuxCast.org. That will just transfer you to our Anchor.fm page where you can literally subscribe to the podcast on basically any podcatcher that you could possibly imagine. We're on, there's like 10 of them that we're officially on, and there's also like an RSS feed there in case you want to do it the old-fashioned way. You could do it that way. Uh, you can contact us via email, email at the linuxcast.org. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast. Thanks, everybody who does so. I will thank you by name at the end. You can follow uh, Tyler, who goes by Zany, on the internet uh, at on Odyssey and YouTube and on Discord. Uh, his YouTube channel is like... Did you pass 850 this week? Is that did I see that? Yep. So he's mm-hmm. he's passed 850. So he's like this close to a thousand. He, he like so close to a thousand. We're gonna get him there by the end of the year, or or literally die trying. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and he's promised us all turkey. By the way, if he gets to a thousand <laughs> subscribers, because he's got like three turkeys, he's got plenty of plenty enough for everybody. Exactly. <laughs> three wild turkeys. Come on now, and they're getting fatter every day. Maybe because they're starving the chickens. <laughs> uh, I would not be surprised. <laughs> Anyways, you can also subscribe to the Linux Cast on YouTube at YouTube dot com slash linux cast uh just to you know on a similar note we're this close to five thousand subscribers like lit- <laughs> we're at 4.84 right now as we speak so um yeah that, and we're gonna get there by the end of the year or die trying <laughs> i like i i i hate taking stuff for granted and uh, just assuming that the growth is going to continue the way it has but if the growth does continue the way it has uh, should see five thousand in the next two weeks. Ooh, yeah. All right. Uh, I will do a special stream or something to commemorate five thousand. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, the original plan for five thousand subscribers was to do the first live Linux cast, but we've already done that. Like, uh-huh. we, we we we've done that. We, we've done a couple now. 
uh, on that uh, on that subject, we are going to live stream every other Linux cast. Uh, so we won't be doing next week. We'll do the week after, um, at least for now. Eventually, probably we'll do all of them. Right now, we're just doing every other one. Uh, the way it's going to work is if you're in the live, you know, like the live chat, um, you'll have access to this episode and the way we record it. You'll get the pre-show, you'll get the post-show, and all that stuff. The video is not going to get deleted, but immediately after we stop recording, the video will go from public to unlisted. Okay, and the reason why I'm doing that is because I want most of the views to go to the edited one, which will appear on Friday. It, it, it's when we did the whole split thing where I left both of them up. Uh, it split the views. We got the same amount of views total if I combined them. It just messed with my OCD, the fact that we split them. So I'm uh, don't mind me. I'm crazy town. It's just going to we're going to try it this way. It, there's a good chance later on I'll change it again because that's what I do. But for now, uh, what I probably will do is put a link to the unlisted video in the show notes. So if you want to go back and watch the chat, you can. Uh, for the most part, all we do during the pre-show is bullshit about chickens and donkeys. Uh, and mm-hmm. although I don't yep. think we missed, we, we talked about donkeys. We talked about sheep and we talked about chickens and turkeys and, uh, uh, wagons yeah that's yep. that's basically mm-hmm. what we talked about during the pre-show so uh you don't miss much <laughs> just, uh, you just you don't miss much anyways uh so that's what's happening with that um subject to change because i'm experimenting that's the reason why we're only doing it every other one anyways okay uh gen 2 or 9 front for the 5k special uh, says f society uh no <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we, we, with, we, with, with the right amount of donations on Patreon, <laughs> it could be, it could be a Gen 2. I, I was going to say, uh, we, we know when Gen 2 will happen. Okay. Uh, so anyways, that is contact information. Now, every single week, Tyler and I scour the internet for amazing Linux news links, and we come up with one each. And this week we actually managed to find two links that were actually news, which is, um, mm-hmm. Better than kind last. Of impressive. <laughs> like usually, one or the other of us choose something different, but this week they're actually news. So, Tyler, what news item did you choose this week? Uh, a glorious little article on Valve's new stable Steam client update that has now brought some improved features for us, including Pipewire uh, can now uh, you can now do desktop capture uh, from Pipewire. Um, all you have to do is use the dash pipe wire uh, command line option um, when you launch uh, the Steam client, um, which is awesome. And another one that I think is really good, since we are our main topic is pretty much you know about slower internet speeds and being stuff being best or worst for that. Um, you also it, it also reduces the size of the Vulkan pre caching. Um, stuff for that that you've got to download when you're going to play a game using proton Uh, so that's really awesome and for for those of you who like are limited or capped uh data from your provider amazing uh because we all know we all know just how big some freaking games are call of duty just expecting you to have an extra 160 gigs for it you know just because you rich like that So uh, every little bit they can scrape uh, scrape off of um, the extra bits and pieces that you have to download to be able to play stuff like that. Awesome. Yeah, uh, that, and, that is cool. Um, mm-hmm. I wonder what do you? Th- I mean, they they have a uh, like a. Um, uh, uh, a memory card. Good lord, Matt. Names, hard words. Um, <laughs> like they have memory a memory card slot on the Steam Deck. So, do you think there'd be like a service from somebody, probably not Valve itself, but that like sells like memory like game cartridges for the Steam Deck? That'd be actually kind of really cool. Like even if it was like just like retro games or something like that. Like I mean, I mean, most no most people will just download that stuff, but it'd be kind of actually yeah. cool. 
to for people who you know couldn't have access to the internet to be able to go out and just say you know I bu- I bought a few game cartridges with Mario on it or something that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, well, see the problem with that though is it's because it's going to be on a mi- it's essentially just a micro SD card uh, card slot. I don't think I don't think many uh, game publishers are going to be interested in making their games for. Um, like well, just on that format. Yeah, it's not going to be the big ones. I'm mean, talking about more like small, like Linuxy developers. You know? Maybe, maybe. Uh, uh, I just don't know though because if you've already got a big micro SD card slot in there, or uh, already a micro a big micro SD in there, why not just download your small indie game to the SD card that you've already got? But then also when it comes to distributing like the like retro games and stuff, I mean already you're how you're acquiring those games is not technically the most legal route ever if you're downloading the ROM. So uh, Yeah, true. Yeah, I don't know. Um it was just thought But it but it is a cool idea. People definitely could do the whole, you know, behind closed doors, like, hey, here's a game cartridge with like all of the NES games on it. Well, see, I, I, it's just I I missed the days of actually having game cartridges. Like, uh, it's just like you remember you go because there was something special about going to like the like like even just like the local the local uh, electronic store and buying the Mario Kart's game or uh, getting Mario sixty four in a cartridge for Christmas. You know, like you actually got something like. It, Nowadays, if your parents give you like a video game for Christmas, what they're actually doing is handing you like a, a, a Steam redemption code. Like, ooh, yeah. this was really fun to unwrap, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, the, like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting old. <laughs> you know, it's like that. that, that it's a lot harder. Digi- to- digital games are completely taking away the fun aspect of getting a game. You know, like unwrapping it and then having it to like hold on to for a long time. Yeah, like oh, so. I remember vividly the the Nintendo sixty four getting that for Christmas from my mom and dad, and I remember how just t- totally excited I was to get because it was my first brand new console. Every console I had before that had come from like a garage sale. Like we weren't, mm-hmm. we never bought a brand new one before that one, and it was just, I mean, it was such a special memory that I have in my head. Like nowadays, I mean. First of all, I don't console game anymore, but also their games. I mean, like, like eighty dollars a game is just way too expensive for me. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't. I mean, it's just dumb. All right, or and, if you want to get the premium edition, just just spend one hundred and thirty bucks. Well, well, you got that, it. You, you you pay eighty dollars for the game, and then you don't get the whole game. If you want more, you have to get the down DLC, which costs even more money. Uh, this is why I'm not a gamer. Uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons. The other reason I, I is I'm terrible at games. Uh, but I, I've been playing. So this is dumb. I got on um, on my phone. Um, I've been playing a game called. Let me look at this. It's it's called Apple Night, and it is like a like a two D scroller type thing. It's really really fun. Uh, there's another one called Dan the Man, which is also similar, and that one has is less Mario and more, um, like I don't I don't really how to. Ex- other than he beats the crap out of people in 2D. It's kind of fun. It's really fun. Uh, anyways, uh, so mobile games have turned uh, my thing. Anyways. Uh, you said mobile games. Guess what game I downloaded? Clash of Clans? Did you download Clash mm-hmm. of Clans? <laughs> yeah. I should, I, should, I should download it and we should create our own clan. I have. I don't actually have it downloaded anymore. Um, well, I have. I had it on my old phone, but when I switched to my new phone, I didn't re-download it because unacceptable. That was that was one of the core reasons that you said you couldn't get a Linux phone. You have to at least keep it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, the the problem is I was so reluctant to join into a clan again because when you join into a clan, you have to have there's a, a responsibility to be there and participate and do wars and stuff like that because they have like every two days you have a war like a clan war where clans compete against each other and if you get in if you get put into a war you have to be there if you don't your whole clan suffers because everyone has to do their two battles right so um i didn't want that responsibility again it was it was too much of a time thing because also at the beginning of the month they have something called clan war leagues where a whole bunch of clans are put into a league and they compete against other leagues and uh 
that takes place for the first seven days of the month. And you have just one battle each day, but it's still something that you have to remember to do. And uh, it just was something that I wasn't, you know. I know. I mean, being being a clan leader is is tough work. I totally <laughs> it, understand it, is. That. it definitely is. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll, maybe I will have to download it again, and we'll have to uh, play that. That'd be fun. All right. Anyways, uh, <laughs> wow, <laughs> that was. <laughs> Ooh, that was, I, it was still gaming, so it was on topic. Okay, all right. Uh, my topic for the week is uh, more GNOME stuff. I have had GNOME mm-hmm. on the mind because I've been using GNOME, so I've been paying attention. You to love them. GNOME. You keep keep going. You didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I killed him. Nah. <coughs> Dead. All right. Um. All right, so Gnome 42, which will be the next release of Gnome, is finally going to have a Gnar... Uh, a a, a Gnar? G- I was going to call it a Gnark mode. A Gnark mode. They need to call it that. This is not KDE where you got to put a K in front of everything, okay, man? It's all right. <laughs> uh, they're going to finally have a dark mode preference, and um, they're doing it in a weird way. It's not going to be changing themes. So, like, normally when you want to change a theme in Gnome, you change to a dark theme. You change to Adewate Dark or whatever. It is. Uh, they're doing something a little bit different. I didn't really understand it. Um, and leave it to Gnome to do things the, the hardest way possible. I mean, literally, you have a dark theme. Like, Adewita has a dark theme. Just swatch that th- swap that thing over. Uh, and literally, I, like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, this is a color code situation where it's just literally changing color codes f- for the the widgets or whatever. I don't... I don't I mean, I'm not a developer, so I'm assuming there has to be more to it than that. There has to be something that has stopped them from doing that from, you know, the beginning. Hold up. No, I'm going to go ahead and stop you there. I won't let any developer convince me that changing hex codes is that difficult. Well, no. Nah. I mean, if, you, if, you can, if you can already display all of this information and everything, you can go and change the hex codes for it. Like, don't, don't try and convince... There might be a lot of different hex codes to change. I'll agree with you there. It's time-consuming. But it's not difficult i mean even if they don't like i i but the thing is is that gtk is is coded in i mean it's coded in c right i i, I let's assume that it's coded in c and i'm it's not python it, it, it's not assembly <laughs> language i mean c c and c plus plus and i think c all the other c variants all recognize hex code for colors uh, like i'm like i'm not a developer so i could be completely 100 percent wrong uh, but for sure for sure c plus plus does so um because we know that from dwm it does support hex codes so i mean the the, the changing co- colors now there has to like maybe the assets themselves would have to be changed but it doesn't maybe that's not how they defined the colors maybe they didn't fi- define the colors as hex codes um, i mean even then I'm, again, you're just changing the color code. Like, well, uh, well I mean, I- I- if it is the assets themselves that are the colors, and it's not defined by co- color codes, but instead, like a, y- you know, like the button itself is like a, an actual image, like it's like a PNG oh file or something. Like, it, it, first of all, if that's <laughs> the way you're doing this, what what is this? The night we have we have so many more problems. <laughs> I, if that's the case. It, it, so. Uh, there there has to be something there has to be something other than their stupid um you know uh j- path you know that they've set themselves on there has to be something that has prevented them from doing this before um like like I, and i don't know what it is but at least it is happening so there will be a dark mode in gnome 42 whether or not it'll be a good dark mode we are going to have to wait to see uh, the the thing is, is I think that they will end up getting way too much credit for this. Okay, mm-hmm. so like Elementary OS six, for all intents and purposes, was a complete step back from Elementary OS five, like in terms of mm-hmm. functionality and software availability and stuff like that. Now they did have mm-hmm. some cool accessibility features that are good, and they spent some time on. But the vast majority of their work for EO, Elementary OS six was spent with two things dark mode and instituting flat packs which actually made elementary os6 worse okay yep. but it got good reviews because the dark theme was so good 
right? It, <laughs> it made it look very pretty. And uh, I think that the same thing is going to happen with Gnome, that, that uh, they'll get a lot of credit for having a dark mode, even though they're years late, even though it was literally not the hardest thing ever. Um, but uh, I think they'll get so much more credit for doing this and and being uh, community forward. Oh, look at this. We're listening to the community. They wanted a dark theme. Here you go. And uh, that's totally not... <laughs> Uh, like this one thing does not wash away the rest of the uh, the stinkiness that is on GNOME because of their lack of interest in allowing people to customize. If they truly wanted people to to if they truly want it, I mean, this is like the fourth week in a row we've talked about this, so we don't really need to belabor mm-hmm. the point. But uh, seriously, just allow people to install extensions from the App Store. Like and wh- no more. That like it's literally all you have to do. Like all you have to do make the, make extensions first class citizens, and we're good. Uh, like I don't even care about the themes. Like you're gonna have a dark theme, dark and light theme. That's all you need. I got like I can understand not wanting a third part to mess around with third party, you know, themes or whatever. Fine, whatever. I don't care. Uh, I would like it, but leave that to the hacking community. Uh, oh. But the extensions are supposed to be part of your, you know, your system, and you've. You have to go to a web browser, install a web extension, uh, in order to install them. <laughs> it's, it's the dumbest. The one thing I am interested though is I I wonder if after Gnome gets its own baked in dark mode, if we'll start seeing people commenting more on wanting a change in the look of a Dueda, just because of how like contrasted with black behind it. I have a feeling that you'll notice just just how much like well. Poo-poo? It mean, looks. They have to, Tyler. They have to change that icon theme. Like that would look absolutely like garbage with a dark theme. Mm-hmm. Literally. Well, right. I mean, I think it looks garbage with a light theme. But, <laughs> it you know, does, but it's going to look way worse with a dark theme. It, I, the thing is, I don't think that they're going to change it. I, I have seen Ooh. nothing of them saying that they're going to change the icon. And, and honestly, the thing is, is the chrome around the windows of Adawaita isn't the worst part of Adawaita. It's always been that icon thing that is just the worst part. It's yeah. so, so bad. I don't know what designer out there so, thought that this was a good idea, but those icons are atrocious, and they need to take their design card away from that person. Like, that person should not be allowed to design things for, like, 90 days and have to go back to, like, design yeah. <laughs> They should get, like, a YouTube, like, ban, like, for a little bit. Like, <laughs> you got a strike, boy. You just need to calm down. Like, like, like you, you need to go to, like, uh, Envato, Envato Elements or, like, uh, one, one of those touchplus.com or something and have yourself a tutorial in GIMP or, or <laughs> Inkscape or something in good design because that is I mean, obviously design is, is very subjective but I only know a few people that like that icon theme and those people are all weird no, no offense <laughs> I love you all dearly okay <laughs> but that icon theme is bad alright anyways um, uh, so that is the news, and we're only uh, 43 minutes into the show. <laughs> Thank you. And it's actually early for us, so let's let's move on to the main topic. The main topic this week was Tyler, so Tyler, tell us what we're going to be talking about for the main topic this week. Is Linux better than Mac OS or Windows for very slow dial-up ish speeds? Which one would you... Alright, so let's say I take you, I throw you into the edge of the desert, just on the edge of society, where you might still have some internet, but it's real poo-poo. It's real bad. Which operating system, not out of preference, would you rather be stuck with? Okay, so I would answer Linux, but I don't think that the operating system at that point is going to have very much impact on your speeds at all. And the reason no, why... No, 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 I'm not talking about speeds, but you have to think about using it. So I guess here here's a better question. Which which one out of those operating system would you rather get an update for? Uh, no, okay, you're gonna have to say it again. You cut out there through the sentence. Oh. Uh, which one of those operating systems would you rather get an update for? Oh, um, well that's easy. I would rather have something like Ubuntu or Debian uh, Linux because you're only gonna get updates every once in a while for for them. Uh, and uh, if you don't update, 
on those, you're not going to break your system when you do update. Uh, like so, definitely Linux um, because you're not forced to update on Linux. You can go through and uh, just use your computer forever. I mean, even if you cho chose Arch in that scenario, you can just use your computer forever and ever and not update. Uh, granted, if you tried to update, then you'd probably break stuff. But with Windows, especially Windows, you're forced to update. Like you have no choice unless you you buy the like the the, the enterprise version of Windows. Uh, you have to update. You can continue to put them put it off. I think you can every seven days. You have to go into the settings and tell it to uh, not you know update for seven days. You have to do that every seven days. You can do that, but I think they, they limit you that to three tries. And after that. They force you to update. And the thing about Windows Update is it's always in the background, so you don't even know if it's updating. So you, mm -hmm. um, when, when you said dial-up, I, I got a little scared away because cause I know there are still people who use dial-up. Like, there are a lot of people who still use dial-up, but I think a lot of people are still using, like, DSL. Like, DSL is much more popular even more than, than dial-up is. And the thing about DSL is the farther you are away from, like, the node, the slower it is because it's all, you know, it's based on, mm -hmm. you know, like, line of sight or whatever, however it works. Um <laughs> Uh, but you know, if you're in a, like a, a, a DSL situation, I wouldn't want to run Windows uh, because it's going to force you to update. Uh, the difference is, I would say, is that at least with Windows, you're only updating the the, the operating system. With with Linux, when you do an update, it updates everything. So it updates your mm -hmm. browser, it update, updates every single piece of software you have. So that is going to play into the situation, the scenario a little bit because you're going to be downloading more, I think, with Linux than you would necessarily with Windows because you're not updating everything when you update with Windows. Granted, but again, you're not forced to do that. Mm -hmm. But I, so out of the the trifecta of operating systems here. I think Mac OS gives Linux its actual run for its money because on Mac OS, even though technically it's going to force you to take updates, but not really. On If you tell an, a Mac not to update, guess what? It listens. That's mind-blowing. I know Microsoft, you could really learn something there. It listens to the user. But when you do do an update, you're not going to be updating all of the, well, you're going to get the updates to the Apple software that comes with your PC, but you're not going to be updating, you know, the Chrome that you've got installed, Firefox, whatever you're using. Um, so it most likely is going to be smaller, but also at the same time, uh, Mac does have the thing of where it when you do an update, you do have to reboot and it's going to apply the update while the system is in an unusable state. Um, yeah. But I think Macs do a much better job at, at compressing their stuff than uh, Windows does. Maybe even a better job that, than Linux does in a lot of cases. So you might end up with a smaller download. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know enough about Mac to actually say. So I couldn't really put in any information on there I do know that the ultimate solution it for at least if you if let's say you're forced to use Windows the ultimate solution is just to unplug your computer from the internet like just don't connect to the internet at all uh, and only do so when you know you absolutely have to because it's never going to try to update when there's no internet because you actually have to have the internet in order to update so that's your solution if you have Thanks. And then while you're plugged into this, to the internet, go through and hit that button to say, don't do this for seven days um, or three days or whatever it is. And uh, then it's, as long as you're only connected during those three days, I mean, it, it, it sounds like asinine to actually have to think about that. Right. Um, but I mean, I know a lot of, a lot of people who don't have internet at their house at all, and they just go to you know like a, a, the nearest city or whatever in order to do their internet browsing and stuff again, and then they go back home. Like um, that's still the case. I mean, and that's not just like in like the middle of Africa or something. That's like here in the United States. <laughs> like there's mm -hmm. a, there are places here in the U.S. that don't have good internet connection. Uh, it's only been within the last five years at this house that I've had good internet connection. 
you know, um, mm-hmm. and even then I wouldn't qualify it as good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I would qualify it as expensive. <laughs> there you I, go. I would qualify. Somebody tweeted out. I don't, I don't know who it was. It was one of my followers on Twitter. Uh, they were a part of a thread where everybody was naming their price and speeds for internet. I was shocked to see that a lot of people, like wherever Quinn from Snazzy Labs is, he has like Google Fiber. He gets a gigabit, a gigabit speeds both up and down, for seventy dollars a month. Holy Christ! I wish right. And one of my other followers, he said he pay he had a uh, hundred megabits up and down for twelve dollars a month, and I was like, I pay a hundred and five dollars a month just for internet. I get supposedly supposedly this is what i pay for 200 megabits down and uh i don't ever get that by the way never not even close i get around 100 and uh the the stupid thing is is the up the ups upload speeds have has not changed since 2005 <laughs> you know when we, when oh we had gosh. this stuff we i still get 10 megabits up like that's it. I'm surprised. Really? I'm surprised we can even do the podcast with, with those <laughs> speeds these days, right? Um, but yeah, that's the, that's literally what we get. It's, I, I would I would like give my right hand for having symmetrical speeds, but it just doesn't happen. We live literally. There are horses next door. Okay, so we live <laughs> in the country. All right, we're talking about this. You know. Uh, so the thing about internet is everywhere it seems to be a mess. Um, and you know, I know it's kind of off topic, but, uh, I mean, it's not really, I mean, we are talking about internet speeds and it just, it just, it just bothers me. I think it bothers everybody, but what are we going to do about it? Cause what can we do about it? Like if Mm -hmm. you literally, if you're in a place, you literally have one choice for internet, whether it's, you know, Comcast or I have wow, which, you know, whatever. I mean, the last thing I would say when I talk about the service and uh, from this company would be "Wow," you know, <laughs> like, yeah. like, that's not a, an exclamation I would be using. Uh, so, so the, let's transition a little bit into old hardware because when, when you brought up this topic, I kind of thought about uh, old ho- older hardware because I like I have an old ThinkPad, I have that uh, computer behind me that they're all older. And I find it really interesting that Linux still does such a good job on older hardware. And I'm not just talking like LX Cute or you know uh, P- Light Linux Lite or you know the the develop the puppy Linux the, the dev- distros that are meant for lower end hardware. Even on that um, ThinkPad, which has a like a, a 2011 processor in it, like it's a 10 year old processor. I can still run like KDE Plasma on that system, and it runs fine. Like and mm-hmm. like the the most recent KDE Plasma, like Kubuntu or you know Arch or whatever, and um, that just continually like astonishes me. Like it's so good. I mean, that's the reason why I use Linux. Yeah, to to me, I love the fact that we still like I I personally talk with on Discord multiple people who are like using still to this day Intel Core 2 Duo systems perfectly happy on Linux. Like if it was Windows, could you imagine trying to use a Core 2 Duo on a Windows 11 or 10? It would set it, it would set itself on fire, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> like that'd be a case of self-immolation. <laughs> yeah. Windows would be like, um, you don't have a processor in here. There there's just not one. Yeah, it's, like I, I was talking to somebody who was using uh, uh like, I, I'm sure they said like a Pentium four, like that thing. That thing is 25 Ooh. years old, and they were now they were it wasn't like recent Linux. Like it was like a it was an old version of like uh maybe Ubuntu or something, um, but it was still running fine. Like it was still perfectly fine. It was still capable of getting. Like it might have been running fourteen oh four, so they were still getting freaking updates, <laughs> like uh, as of a couple of years ago. Uh, so, so it's like that's just insane. Like the, the it's so it's so awesome, 
and it just makes you kind of feel warm and fuzzy about Linux because it's literally, I mean, I don't want to channel DT here because he made that saving the planet thing, but uh, mm-hmm. like you're literally saving the planet a little bit if you use Linux on these older older pieces of hardware. Um, mm-hmm. Plus, I mean, we almost have to use old hardware now because you can't buy new hardware anymore. Like, it's Without it's, encountering too many issues, like, it's just not worth it. Come on. Uh, and also, now with prices being like seven times what they're actually worth, why purchase anything? All right. So because I've been thinking that my computer has hardware problems, whether it does or not, I don't, I'm don't. i still hoping that it doesn't. But I went through and just for shits and giggles built a system on System76. I was like, you want know to if I'm going to buy a new, new computer, I'm going to support a small hardware vendor that you know supports Linux. And because I live in the United States and we don't have the plethora of awesomeness that is Linux hardware that the EU has, like Tuxedo and Slimbook and all this stuff, we don't have access to that. Uh, mm. and, and importing it would just make it obscenely expensive. Um, uh, so I was like, I built one on System76. So I was like, the actual hardware, like the, the, like the, the CPU and the case and all that stuff, it was fine. It came to like... Eighteen hundred dollars. I mean, it's still expensive compared to where we were like two years ago. But that was without a GPU. <laughs> like you added a GPU to it, it tripled the price. Holy crap! Like, like, like they wanted like an. It was like a um the sixty eight hundred the Radeon sixty eight hundred the the like I think it was like last year's uh, AMD card. They wanted like fourteen hundred dollars just for the card. And that's the AMD Ooh. one. If you wanted like a 3080, like a, a, an NVIDIA card, it was like $4,000. <laughs> oh my Christ. Like, like I understand this is not Sips of 76 fault fault because they're literally buying this stuff off the shelf, you know? Mm. So they have to pay that price because that's what they're charging. And I was like, how is this not price gouging? Like this has to be, there's no way the market has bared those prices. Like that's not... Like that well, I mean, that, there, there, there probably will be some like legal action after all this calms down. Because I mean, if you remember, there, the uh, all of the RAM manufacturers got together, hiked up prices of RAM and everything. Then there was the massive court fallout from that, but that still lasted a while. Like RAM was super expensive for like almost an entire year. So. Yeah, and it's still just coming down. Like now, I was looking the other day. Like, um, the thing is, is it is actually fifty dollars cheaper. Like, I was looking because, again, I, every time I have a compu- a problem with Linux, somebody blames the cheap Chinese RAM that I have in my computer. So I was like, well, maybe I'll just buy some new stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I was looking like they have some Team Group stuff for like two hundred eight bucks, and that's like fifty bucks cheaper than it was before. So I, was, I, I decided I would wait a little bit and see if it came down a little bit more. But, um. Yeah, so at least that has started to come down. I, like, I, I don't know. Prices are just stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I don't, <laughs> like like I, I don't understand. It's like I'm not an economics guy, but it seems like we could probably do something about this. I mean, yeah, <laughs> may, just a little something would be nice. Like, I don't want to get into politics, but they said that the number of people going to Europe on vacation is like two times more than it was in 2019. Maybe if fewer people were going on vacation and more people were actually, you know, working. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, we have ships waiting at the docks that have they have our shit on them. Let's get that stuff off from there. Then you can go on vacation. All right. like I would go do that stuff, but I have a job, okay? <laughs> like, like, I'm already working here. Right? It's all right. Anyways, uh, anything else to say on the internet thing before we move on, Tyler? Mm, nope. I think we're good. All right, good. Um, moral of the story, use Linux in all situations. What kind of fucking question was that, Tyler? Use fucking <laughs> Linux. I mean, it wasn't even a question. Of course you use Linux. I mean, come on. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, it, let's move on. Every week, Tyler and I uh, choose something. We... We use apps. We do picks. I call them apps. I call them picks. It doesn't matter what the hell the section is called. Uh, usually it's apps. But this t- So picks of the week. Tyler, what is your pick of the week? Mine is TurboStat, which is a beautiful little command line program, uh, which um, if you are familiar with like LM-sensors or the sensors command, um, 
it essentially just is going to spit out a lot more information. You're going to get processor topology or topology, uh, frequency, idle power state, statistics, temperature, power, all that good stuff. Um, and uh, like one of the things about it that I really like is you get the full breakdown between like uh, T die and um, all the other different like it gives you a very good readout of all of your systems informations. Um, and if you're if you were looking for something like you, you wanted to do some torture testing or just make sure that your system is thermally stable, um, TurboStat's a great uh, great program for that. Um, and also, if you if you're like me and you had something where that you know something weird going on with your temperatures at idle and you wanted to figure out why turbostat will help you do that within minutes it's it's beautiful is it just for the cpu or will it also do like gpu temperatures and stuff um it depends i'm pretty sure that it does support some gpus and will give you some statistics on them um but uh you shouldn't expect it that, that like it should that if, if it does recognize your graphics card or anything extra like that and gives you readouts like it did recognize um my aio was in there so it gave me a pump readout but it didn't give me anything else like it didn't recognize the fans or anything like that um but yeah uh further than your CPU and memory and stuff like that. If anything else works, that's just a nice little cherry on top. Uh, but for your main system specs, uh, like your CPU, yeah, you're going to get a really good readout of info there. Okay, I'll definitely give that a try. That's cool. Uh, I need to redo my temperature script for my bar. So I'm, I've always used LM sensors for that, but maybe I'll try this instead. All right, so my pick of the week is something called Time Trap. And basically what Time Trap is, is a time tracking application, a uh, CLI application that allows you to keep track of time. It's literally all it does. It's very powerful, has a ton of different things. You can go through and keep track of different projects. You can keep track of different, uh, you can have different sheets for like time tracking your like clocking and stuff like that if you do that stuff. Um, this is really cool if you are like a freelancer or whatever, and you have to been taking freelance jobs where you can, hey, where you have to keep track of your time work because you get paid by the hour. Uh, this can do that. And you can also have it saved so that you can then send it to the client if you need to, so that they can actually read it in a, a reasonable way of doing it. it. Cause it will output it. To, it will output to certain, uh, uh, formats and stuff like that so it can be sent to other places um and it's really cool so if you enjoy using things that are um uh, in the terminal and you don't want to deal with because if you've done any freelancing at all you know that the time tracking applications that usually come with things like upwork or uh any of those like freelancing websites those things are almost always utterly garbage at one point i they're no longer they no longer are but at one point they were all coded in adobe air like <laughs> you know, right Christ, <laughs> what right because that's how that's how they did it so they could be cross-platform right because they needed uh... to, they need that was before the days of electron uh that's probably what they're in now is electron uh, but that what they needed to do was to be able to have an application that worked across platform that would take sc periodic screenshots so that they could sh you could show proof of work so you could prove prove that you were going through and doing this now uh, time trap as far as i know won't take those screenshots as far like i said i haven't played around with it that much but i don't think it will do that but it will at least allow you to keep track of your time so if that if that whether or not that's something you're doing for a client or it's something that you just do because you want to you know keep track of how much time you've been spending on a project or whatever uh time trap is actually really cool very powerful and obviously in the terminal so you get your nerd cred as well so um, it's written, uh, it's written in Ruby. So, uh, if you're going to get into the code, you'd have to know, know, know some Ruby, but, uh, it is uh, very good. And I've noticed that it's actually really, really fast. So it's not something that you have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, taking too much resources in terms of time and stuff. So it's actually really good. And if you go through and do, uh, assign uh, aliases to several of like the flags and stuff like that you can go through and uh, just have aliases so that you don't have to type out uh everything that you would normally have to type out if you're using the application so aliases are actually really good for this application as well so that's time trap uh, i don't know why 
Uh, in some places, it's called time strap, and sometimes it's called time trap, but it is time trap. I wrote time strap, but it is time trap, okay, uh, because typing is hard as well as speaking. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, that coming up next week on the podcast, we're going to be uh, talking about the best color schemes. So uh, that should be a fun and entertaining thing. So uh, what I think we'll do, Tyler, is we'll each come up with our top three color schemes and uh, that are like official someone else created color schemes, like whatever. And uh, we'll talk about them. Uh, How in depth we'll get, I don't know. It's going to be the nerdiest episode you've ever come across because, I mean, who else is going to sit there and talk about color schemes for like half an hour? And that's definitely going to be fun. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, so that's coming up then. Uh, the episode uh, after that is our GitLab challenge. Uh, so uh, I actually have to go through and actually do that now. So, so same. Uh, uh, we have to. So that'll be the episode after that. So that is it uh, for uh, on this episode. Before I go, I'd like to take a moment to thank current patrons: Devon, Chris, East Coast Web, Gen Two is Fun Two, Patrick L, Marcus, Meglin, Sven, Jackson, Knife Tool, Steve A, Mitchell, Art Center, Merrick Camp, Joshua Lee, J Dog, and the BSDs Rock. Uh, and my patrons keep continuing to to, to troll me with their names: uh, the BSDs Rock and uh, Gen Two is Fun Two. Love you guys. Uh, keep your names as they are because I finally got this thing down so i can save them without having to uh you know realize the gen 2 is fun too gen 2 is fun too of course gen 2 is fun too uh uh gen 2 is fun too for other people uh, <laughs> so, all right, uh but it's good anyways um so that is this for this time we'll see you next week <laughs>